Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, and Doug Palmer, Senior Trade Reporter, Politico. Good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I'm used to interviewing people, not often uh, in front of like 4,000 people or however many we have here, but uh, uh, I'm game if you are. There's lots going on in the world. <laughs> That's true. I always actually like coming to this event, I mean, because it's held in the springtime every year, and I always like walking up to the front of the hotel and seeing all the tulips and everything. It's, uh, it's sort of a nice spring ritual here in, in Washington. Um, I know that you're, you're very busy. You've been, you've been out and about doing a, doing a lot of things. Um, I thought first that maybe we could talk a little bit about the economic outlook for U.S. exporters. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there was actually a slight dip in exports last mm -hmm. year of both goods and services. And uh, it looks like it might be another slow year in 2016. I just wondered, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing exporters currently? Well, you know, I mean, exports are going to go up and down over time, depending upon the global economy. And obviously, first of all, if your customers' economies are slowing down, that'll affect you. And the world economy has been slower, as you're well aware of. You know, China slowing, Brazil being uh, really slow. Uh, Russia relations are challenged right now. And so some of the biggest markets that we do business with, there's there's challenges. But on the other hand, incredibly strong relationship with Mexico, with Canada, with some of our largest trading partners. Uh, we've grown our trade relationship with Germany, that now we're the number one uh, trade partner with Germany, which is huge opportunity. So I think the strong dollars had an effect also, the, um, but that seems to be, um, there's some air being let out of the tires right now. Uh, so I think that uh, we have, you have to think about exports as a long-term trajectory. Having said that, what's not a long-term trajectory and something that we can focus on right now is market access. Okay. And that's why trade agreements are so important. It's really critical that we ensure that our companies can have access when the conditions are right, and particularly to the fastest growing markets in the world you know, like the Asia Pacific region. Sure, that sounds like a plug for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I was gonna ask you about in, in, in a few minutes. Sure. Um, I did know, I mean, you, I mean, you talked about, the, you know, that, that growth is slowing in a lot of key uh, markets around the world. I mean, China in particular, um, there's been a slowdown. And actually, for the first time, I think, in, you know, at least five or six years, U.S. exports to China we're, we're down in, uh, in 2015. Do you think that that's going to be a challenging market again this year? I think that um, uh, I haven't looked at the numbers you know, for the first quarter, so I, I'm not particularly familiar with that per se. I think that you know, China's economy is slower, and so that'll be, create some headwinds for some of our companies. But on the other hand, growth, for example, it's, it, you can't say writ large what the relationship is like. So for example, clean energy. Clean energy markets in China are growing very fast. It's the largest clean energy market in the world. We took a trade mission last year of clean energy companies to China, and there's a ton of business to be done there. It's not that China doesn't have its own technologies, it doesn't have a comprehensive suite of technologies, so there's a lot of opportunity for American companies. And if you think about XM and the role that XM plays, it's helping, you know, it helps our large companies, but where it really makes a huge difference is for our small and medium-sized businesses. And so it's really critical that we get XM back on the playing field. You know, 80 other countries have equivalent of export-import banks. And, um, you know, we can't afford not to have all the tools in our tool chest for us to be competitive. We have great companies here that want to sell their goods around the world. We at, at the Department of Commerce, we have the U.S. Export Assistance Center and the Foreign Commercial Service that are there to help companies. But we need tools. We need to be able to show up and say, okay, if this is something that the country or can't acquire without financing, and if it fits into the export-import um, uh, criteria, 
why aren't we fin helping to have that sale go through? It supports jobs here. We know 11 and a half million jobs in this country are supported by exports. Right, right. Actually, and you sort of anticipated my question a little bit, because I did sort of want to ask you about the interaction between the Commerce Department and, and the XM Bank in terms of um, finding opportunities for, for U.S. businesses around the, the world. Is there a lot of interaction? We're partners. Yeah. We're partners. We go to market together. This is not a competition. It's, it, it, we have a great relations with the XM Bank. And, uh, you know, we try to, uh, you know, our attitude is, is at the Department of Commerce, our job is to represent and, and be the chief commercial advocate for American business inside the government and externally and around the world. And we work well with Exim, with OPIC, with USTDA, and those are great relations. Right. Well, you, you sort of alluded to this earlier, but I mean, we all know that XM went through this near-death experience last year, almost didn't get reauthorized. And, um, and there's, there's still a problem right now because it doesn't have a full board of directors, and Senator Shelby in particular doesn't seem to be uh, interested in, in moving any nominations. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? I don't get it. I really don't get it because, um, frankly, uh, as I said, we need all the tools in our tool chest. Uh, the Exim Bank, I think in 2015, fiscal year 2015, supported uh, 2,300 small and medium-sized corporations being able to do business. Uh, that Exim Bank is a net, is profitable, or let's say, put another way, doesn't cost the taxpayers any money, uh, and it helps American competitiveness, and it gets us at the table, even if XM, so for example, we were down in Argentina with the president, la not last week, the week before, and the number one issue on President Macri's um, topic of discussion with the president of the United States was pleased to ask the XM Bank to come back and do business with Argentina. For them, it was a vote of confidence in their economy. And uh, obviously there's a process for that to occur, which we explained to President Macri. But the point is, the presence and the activity of Exim Bank serves many, many functions. Not, o not only helping our own economy and helping our own businesses, but it also can serve if, as a stamp of approval to an economy if Exim is, w is able to do business with that economy. That means that economy has met a certain standard of credit standard and capability of paying their bills. So it's very, very important tool in many aspects of uh, uh, not just the American uh, economy, but around the world. Okay. Um, I noticed that one of the sort of themes of your tenure at the Commerce Department has been this idea of, of commercial diplomacy. And, um, I, you know, I think that that's, that's, that's been around for a while, but, um, I understand, like last year, for example, Foreign Policy Magazine named you Commercial Diplomat of the of the year. Um, but but what what are your ideas on on this on on commercial diplomacy? Is it, is it mainly government officials like yourself advocating on the on the on the part of business, um, or is there something more to it than that? Yeah, let me try and explain what commercial diplomacy is. And the idea is is a pretty simple one. But what, where to come from? You know, I've been to probably close to 40 countries around the world since I've been in this uh, position, a little less than three years. And um, I haven't been to a country yet that doesn't want more American businesses and doesn't want more American products. And it's why, and it, and it's why we want, need the Exim Bank. Um, but commercial diplomacy is the opportunity for the U.S. government to work hand in hand alongside our private sector with foreign governments to talk about um, policies those governments have that are impeding either greater engagement by American business, greater ability for American products to enter their markets. And, um, you know, we address policies like everything from intellectual property protection or trade secrets protection to uh, uh, rule of law to um, access to the markets or customs, arbitrary customs processes or arbitrary use of the tax 
their tax code to prevent the uh, uh, market access for American businesses. So it's a partnership between the federal government and our private sector to work together. And I'll give you an example. So the president had the ASEAN Leaders uh, Summit, uh, I don't know, about six weeks ago in Sunnylands, and we were out there and we organized for Satya Nadella of Microsoft and um, the CEO of, uh, of Intel and, or of Cisco and uh, Ginny Rometty from IBM to meet with the leaders from the ASEAN countries together with our federal government. And these c leaders of the ASEAN countries want more growth in their digital economy. They want to see more uh, activity, more innovation, more entrepreneurship, greater digital products in their economies. But these leaders were able to explain to them, look, but you also have policies that are preventing us from coming into your countries, such as data localization or uh, limits on the ability to, to engage with their digital economy or censorship or different things like that. And so it was able to connect the dots for these leaders as to, you know, you say you want one thing, but your policies are in a very different place. And it's not just the fed, our federal government explaining this, which we do, mm -hmm. but when they hear from a business leader who says, you know, if you were to be change your policy, we would be more likely to do more in your country or enter your country, et cetera. That's the, that is a far more effective. And so, you know, what we found is having U.S. companies, large and small, at the table with us, uh, traveling with us around the world, working not on their book of business, not on the issues necessarily that are solely uh, important for their company, but on behalf of American business writ large, we found that we're having you know greater success. Uh, and so I think commercial diplomacy is an important tool in our foreign policy tool chest and one that our administration has embraced, and it's something that benefits the United States. It create, helps to create American jobs and greater opportunity for our companies. Right. So it sounds like it's less about making sales in the short term, although I assume mm -mm. people would be happy if that happened, but, but, but creating a long-term environment for, for business. It's really, exactly. It's yeah. really about addressing the business environment in different countries. And we've done it in India, for example. Okay. Uh, we created, we elevated the commercial relationship between the United States and India, equivalent to our strategic relationship. So now Secretary Kerry and I do a joint meeting with the Indian government. The commercial group meets on, and economic side meets on one side, and the strategic meets together. We meet it all at the same time. That's a kind of, um, and that's allowing us, and we. Uh, to make progress. And one of the things that we've done is we've married that meeting with the U.S.-India CEO forum. So the agenda on the commercial side is, is influenced by what the CEOs in both countries think would be most effective so that we can increase the amount of trade that we're doing. That's good for in India, that's good for the United States, and by elevating the commercial dialogue to be equivalent to the strategic dialogue, it gets more attention in both our governments. I, I remember back during the heyday of the National Export Initiative um, that uh, cabinet officers, when they, when they did overseas trips, they were supposed to advocate on behalf of American business or a particular business deal. Does that sort of stuff still still go on? Well, Doug, we run the advocacy center at the Department of Commerce, and we have not stopped. Uh, uh, that is a, a something that, frankly, Ron Brown created when he was Commerce Secretary, and uh, you know we do greater and greater volume year after year, not only in dollars but also in the number of companies that we um, advocate for. And what we do is it's a whole of government approach. We act as the coordinator with the company who buys our service to have, whether it's the Secretary of Commerce or the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense or the President or whomever in our federal government as they're traveling around the world, if a U.S. company is um, competing for a procurement in another country, we will advocate on their behalf 
uh, and it's been a very effective program. Thank you. You mentioned some of the, di the digital trade barriers like uh, for data localization and, and, such, and, and stuff like that. And I noticed that recently um, you all had announced um, a new set of digital attaches, I guess, to be located in, in six, or six or eight key markets, Brazil, China, Japan, India. Um, just could you, could you talk a little bit about the, behind that and, and what those what those sure. officials so, will be doing? Sure. Um, so our digital trade officers okay. is, is their formal name. Uh, their job, and they are in you know places like also ASEAN, in, including uh, uh, the markets that you mentioned. And their job is to work with both digital companies and non-digital companies to help them navigate in country the barriers or challenges or regulations that affect doing business. So it could be doing business for a digital company or it could be doing business for a non-digital company that's having issues around local digital regulations. And it's been a, uh, there's been a lot of demand for this kind of expertise to be in those foreign markets to help our American companies uh, navigate more easily. And so we're really, it was been very well received. I'm quite excited about it. Uh, and this is what we do. We try to respond to what the market needs. Right, because I think a lot of people see digital trade as a real growth area for the United Our States. Our digital services, I think we do about $400 billion a year of digital trade right now, digital exports, and it's the fastest growing aspect of United States services exports. And so why wouldn't you be helping that you know, uh, effort uh, grow? Yeah. So um, I don't know if you've noticed, but trade agreements have gotten some negative attention in the presidential campaign. <laughs> I missed um, that. You did. <laughs> I've been under a rock somewhere. No. <laughs> so with 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 all that um, that negative re rhetoric, um, are you guys still optimistic you can get the Trans-Pacific Partnership done this year? I am optimistic that we can get it done, and the reason is, let's step back and talk about why is this important. Uh, and and I think that you know we could leave political rhetoric aside for a minute, and let's talk about. Uh, the fact that the strength of our country, or the strength of any country, is very much dependent on the strength of our economy. And being able to sell our goods and our services into the fastest growing marketplace in the world is critical to the strength of American business. You know, and we cannot ignore 95% of our customers are outside the United States. We cannot ignore the fact that um, there have been over 100 free trade agreements that have been executed in the Asia-Pacific region alone since the year 2000. That mean, means other countries' companies have easier access into those markets than our companies do. We can't forget that 11.5 million people's jobs depend upon our ability to export. Now, I'm not ignoring that trade agreements can have an impact on some workers, and that, and that glo globalization can have a, such an effect, or that technology can have an effect. That's why, simultaneously, our administration has been so focused on, you know, skilled workforce training, apprenticeships, internships. I was just in Dallas yesterday uh, meeting with uh, the entire ecosystem within Dallas that's working on workforce training. This is something we take very seriously to make sure that our workforce is globally competitive. We have to do that at the same time. We also have to do, make sure that our trade agreements insist that other countries' labor standards and environmental standards are raised. That helps make American workers more competitive, and we know that. But let's not forget that the Asia-Pacific region, the middle class there, is going from 500 million to 3.2 billion in the next 15 years. If our companies are not present in that growth market, we're going to fall behind. 
And the companies that are present are going to become bigger and bigger competitors of our American leading companies. And those companies need Exim. They need support. They need help with financing. But we also need these trade agreements to give us better access. Bring down tariffs. 18,000 tariffs will be uh, eliminated. And so this is a real opportunity for America to lead, to set the standards for global trade in the 21st century. Right. Well, well, my understanding is that the administration is, is, you know, trying to resolve some outstanding concerns that various industries have raised, and they're also waiting for the International Trade Commission uh, to release its study on the economic impact of the agreement, which is expected, I think, currently in in, in mid-May. I guess my question is, though, um, since the administration obviously feels strongly about this. I mean, do you think that President Obama will submit this a pact to agree, will definitely submit this pact to Congress for a vote? I, I do. The president is all in for TPP. He's completely committed to it. We had a meeting this week. You know, he, we, we're very, very focused on getting this done and trying to get it done as soon as possible. Uh, he recognizes what's at stake. He recognizes how important this is to American industry and the growth of our, and stability of our economy, as well as our national security, how important it is that we play a leadership role in the, in the, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region. And it, this ties back to the conversation we were having earlier about commercial diplomacy. The greater presence the United States has around the world, whether, you know, not just military presence, not just diplomatic presence, but our commercial presence is an extension of America's power. It's an extension of our values. And it's really important that we get this agreement done now. Well, we're getting close to the end, but we still have a little bit of time. And there was a couple of additional issues I wanted to ask you about. One was Cuba. I know that you've been very involved in the opening there. And then just so we don't forget about it, I want to talk about the, 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 the Hanover trade fair before, before we wrap up. So um, what, what's next on Cuba, do you think? Is there anything more the administration can do? Or is it really sort of up to, to Cuba at this point to well, first, let's step back and talk about what we've done. You know, and I was, it was a real pleasure for me to be able to go, uh, go on the president's historic trip to Cuba. And, and in some respects, it was a, um, an ability to recognize all the work that has been done, which is, you know, we played, and the Treasury Department have played a very significant role in changing the regulations as it relates to Cuba. We are still subject to an embargo, and the regulations are, are compliant with the embargo and the laws. But you know, Treasury has created licenses that and now make it a, the ability to pay for things uh, by the Cubans and by Americans of Cuban goods more easy. And we've created commercial licenses that affect the ability of American companies to sell goods in certain categories that are allowed under the embargo. So as a result of these new policies, now you have direct mail, you have direct telephone, you have direct flights, you have the ability for America, you know, it's easier for American companies to uh, do business in Cuba. And it's also easier for Americans to visit. Uh, now, uh, we cannot do business writ large. Uh, there are still restrictions under the embargo. But um, what was really exciting is we were welcomed. The president, the streets were lined when the president during the president's visit. People were clapping. They were excited that he was there. And, and I think that this openness, this engagement is really important. And that's what the president was trying to accomplish by normalizing relationships. Isolation hasn't worked. Let's engage. Let's embrace. Let's see what we can get done together. And, you know, nothing um, signified that more than, you know, the president, both presidents did a press conference, which I don't know how many of you in this room saw. But that was the very first time the Cuban people had seen their president do a press conference. It was a pretty extraordinary moment in time. And uh, you know, this is the kind of things that can happen that can affect change. Right. Well, just, on, just kind of a 
technical question. I mean, I, I know that you've been involved in a couple of like Cuba regulatory dialogues. Is that, you, would you expect there to be another round of those before the end of the administration? Or? Um, we're continuing. It's almost a continuous effort in terms of regulations. Yeah. So one of the things that's really hard to imagine is if you think about it, we didn't really know how the Cuban economy worked. We didn't know how to engage with them. And so the more that we've engaged with them, the more we understand how their economy works, the more it's clear, it becomes clear how to evolve our re regulations to legally allow for certain engagements. But and given that we have you know, an embargo and we have statutory restrictions as to what we can do, and so the dialogue, the regulatory dialogues have helped us to achieve what we've achieved to date, and we'll continue along that effort. Okay, lastly, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the Hanover mess, is mm -hmm. that how you say it, Hanover mess, uh, mm -hmm. trade fair, um, and which I understand the president is going mm -hmm. to. Why, why is the president going to a German manufacturing? Well, first of all, Hanover mess is the largest trade fair in the world. Uh, and the president is going for a number of reasons. You know, first of all, to send a message that uh, how important the relationship is between the United States and Germany, and that we're partners in every way, not just in national security, not just in addressing some of the world's ch most challenging uh, problems, whether it's ISIL or Ebola, uh, but also as it relates to commerce. And, um, you know, uh, the U.S., as I said, is now Germany's top uh, export uh, market. And we do about $234 billion of goods and services trade, so a very important commercial com country for us. Um, but the president is also going. It's an opportunity for him to talk to the German people. I think the opening ceremony gets about 10 or 12 million Germans that uh, watch and participate. Uh, my guess is that may even be larger with the president as the featured speaker. And the reason we're the featured speaker, the president is, is we're what's called the partner country. And it's the first time in history the United States has been the partner country at the, um, at the Hanover Massa. And what it allows us to do is to showcase U.S. technology, innovation, entrepreneurship at the fair, to promote and build business relationships so that we can do more trade, as well as promote foreign direct investment here back in the United States and to promote our Select USA efforts. Um, we're taking the largest delegation of U.S. companies ever to the fair, over 400 companies. Um, and uh, it's, it's an exciting moment. We've never, the United States has never engaged uh, commercially at the fair in such a robust way, and we're really looking forward to it. And having the president there is, um, is a real bonus. Do you, do you think t TTIP will be part of the agenda, or at least lurking in the background a little bit? TTIP will absolutely be part of the agenda. In fact, it will not be in the background. Okay. It will be something that we'll talk about. Uh, uh, and we have a number of events uh, coordinated around that. It's very important, because there's a lot of momentum behind the negotiation of TTIP, and we need to keep that up. Right. I mean, one reason I ask is because it seems like there's a fair amount of suspicion about TTIP in, in, in Europe and even in, even in Germany, and I just wondered if the president would be trying to reassure the Europeans on that front. That it's you know, I think that we, we have to remember that whenever you're in a negotiation, there's suspicion. You know, until it's made transparent and open. I mean, think about TPA and TPP. Everybody had all kinds of concerns. But once it's made available, then it's easier for people to understand. And so, you know, TTIP has got a great pace. I think our U.S. trade rep, Mike Froman, is doing a hell of a job. Uh, he's working very closely with his counterpart. I think they're having weekly meetings. And so there's a lot of momentum there. And the president's presence will certainly help with that momentum. Okay. Well, I think we're about out of time. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us.